Welcome back to my channel. We're continuing the series Master Databricks and Apache Spark. This is lesson 25, focusing on PySpark. And in this video, we'll be talking about how to use built-in SQL aggregate functions from Python. I'm going right to the demonstration part of this because there's not a lot of conceptual things to explain that I haven't explained in my prior videos, but you can get this notebook for yourself. I'll put a link in the description and you can pull it up and run it. I've got a lot of uh, sort of preliminary documentation to the notebook, but I've talked all about that in prior videos, so I'm going to skip over that. And I'm going to start by just quickly getting a data frame created. And the fastest way I can think of doing that is leveraging the SQL tables we created earlier. We created the database earlier called AW Project, and then we loaded a bunch of CSV files into tables in that video. I'm going to post a link in the description that you can go to if you haven't been following along sequentially so that you can create that database and related tables and therefore be able to run this notebook as well. To do that, you're going to be running this code, which will run Spark SQL to switch the database context to AW project. And then we're going to be running Spark SQL again to select all of the rows in Fact Internet sales. Now I've appended drop NA because I want to drop any rows that have any NA values in them. I'm going to return the results of this to a data frame, which is SPDF underscore sales info. The naming conventions I use is as follows. The first letter is either S or L. S for Spark, L for local, meaning on the driver node. The P indicates the language, in this case Python, and the DF tells me this is a data frame. Then I have an underscore, and then there's just some descriptive information about what this contains, in this case, sales info. A nice thing is that when you run that, you get a description of the data frame, i.e. the column names and data types. Let's take a quick look at some of the data in here. Okay, we can see we have quite a few different columns in here, all related to sales. Some of them are quantitative, like the price, the sales amount, etc., and other ones are more descriptive. Now, normally I would take the values like product key, as you see here, right, product key, and I would join that to the product table to get more descriptive information like the product name and the type, etc. But instead, I'm just going to use the keys as if they were dimension values. And I'm only doing that to save the complexity that would be required to join them so that we can focus on the core thing we're doing here, which is using the aggregate functions. In your real use cases, you'd probably be joining to the product table and to the customer table and getting more meaningful dimension values. I put a bunch of links in the notebook as you go along, so please take a look at those because those are links that have some really good blogs that explain more information about doing this, and I want to credit the people who wrote the blogs because if I found something useful from those blogs, I may have copied into this notebook and then made adjustments to the code to fit my needs, but I definitely want to credit the authors of those blogs, which was very helpful for, to me. When I talk about a aggregate function, what am I talking about? I'm speaking of functions that operate over a set of rows rather than an individual row. What that really means is statistical functions, things that give me the total or the sum, things that may give me the average or give me the highest or lowest values, things like that. So let's look at this Spark SQL cell. What do we have going on? Well, you can tell it's Spark SQL because I have the magic for SQL, percent SQL. And then I just have a regular select statement. And we're taking the data from Fact Internet Sales. Now I want to get the average, so I use the AVG function, and then I pass in the column name that I want to get the average of, in this case, sales amount. And rather than getting this kind of weird looking AVG sales amount as the name of the column, I'll rename the column to AVG underscore sales. I'd like to get the standard deviation as well, so I run the STDDEV function return that as std underscore sales and I want to get the lowest sales amount we have which I will return as min sales. The highest sales amount will be returned as max sales and I want to get the count distinct of the product key. What does that mean count distinct? It means I want to get all of the unique values of product key which tells me how many products are actually represented in this sales table or fact internet sales table. I'll return that as count product key. I'm also going to get the count distinct customer key and that will be returned as count customer key. 
you can see it here, which will be different, right? Because there might be 100 products represented, but 1,000 customers represented. You might wonder, what is this approx underscore? That's not something you would typically see in, say, SQL Server. The approx is because we're dealing with a cluster. And for Spark to come back and give you the exact count would take a lot of work. But it can give you something pretty close to the exact count very quickly. So what it does instead is gives you that approximate count. So in this case, we're going to use the approx count distinct and return that. Let's run this. And we got all our results back. And of course, we could have grouped by and done other things as well. The takeaway is when I'm talking about using aggregate functions from Python, what I really mean is I want to reach in and directly access these functions from my Python code. Now, a really kind of cheat, if you will, to doing that would be simply to use the Spark SQL function itself and then pass in that exact query we just had. And that will return, as we can see here, a Spark data frame with that answer, with those answers. We can display it here. So let's see how that looks. And we got the same thing back. So yes, that is true. We could do that. But that's not what I'm really talking about. Instead, what I want to show you is how to do it without actually referencing the SQL language at all. And what I want to do first is I can use the PySpark SQL functions library and import any SQL functions, not only aggregate, but also scalar functions. But I'm focusing here on the aggregate functions. And we're going to be using, as you saw above, I'm going to replicate the same type of query, but with no SQL. So here I want to bring in the count distinct, which is the average count distinct at the AVG, the min and the max, as well as the standard deviation. So notice the names may be slightly different between the PySpark SQL function library that refers to the same code. And then I can write my code and I'm going to return the results to SPDF underscore AGG. But here's the key thing to watch. I'm going to be using my data frame and I'm going to be calling the AGG function. That function is designed to accept any number of aggregate functions to it. Within the, the AGG function, I'm calling all of the different aggregations I want. So as we saw before, different format of syntax, etc., but it's doing pretty much the same thing. AVG, and then the name of the data frame dot sales amount, right? So we're doing the SPDF underscore sales info, and we want to get the average sales amount. And we can rename it to AVG sales by using the alias method. Standard deviation sales amount, alias STD on STD dev underscore sales. Now I wanted to call attention to two different distinct ways we can pass a column into these aggregate functions. One way is to pass the data frame column name in quotes. The other way is to prefix the column name with the data frame name and then without quotes the name of the column. So either way is acceptable. This I like a little better I think because it's shorter but either way is acceptable. And now we can do our min and the max, the count distincts we saw earlier, and on and on. Now that will return the results to SPDF underscore AGG, and then we can do whatever we want with it. And what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to convert it to a pandas data frame. And it tells you these are all the columns that came back. These are what is in the SPDF AGG. And you can see the values here. You notice that it displayed the pandas data frame similar to the way it would in a Jupyter notebook. And that's one way you can kind of tell that what you're looking at is a pandas data frame. Now I want to be very careful here because although I'm appending the two pandas method to my Spark data frame, I'm not actually converting it. In order to change this to get a pandas data frame back, I would have to assign it to another object. And you can see, in fact, that this is still a PySpark data frame. One other thing I do want to call your attention to. Notice that I am explicitly importing only the functions I need. And I think that's generally a good way to do this, especially for code that's going to go into production. This is a sort of Python, Pythonic principle of explicit versus implicit. And in here, you can see right at the top, what are the 
functions that I'm going to be using. I can just import all of them and I'm going to do that later being a bit lazy which is probably okay if you're just doing some development or exploratory data analysis in most cases because you're not going to move that to production but in the cases where you expect this to be used in production it's better to be very clear you're minimizing the overhead you're only importing what you need and it's easier to read the code because say oh I can see you're going to use a count distinct and AVG a max and a min and it makes it a little bit more self-documenting. Now just to prove what the SPDF underscore AGG really is, is it a pandas data frame now or a Spark data frame? We can use the type function and we can see that, yep, it really is still a Spark data frame. This is the lazy way we can import all of the functions available in the PySpark SQL functions library, which means all of the SQL functions. You notice the only new one we're using here is the group by, but we didn't explicitly ever tell it to import group by. We imported the AVG earlier, and then we're going to convert the results to two pandas. So let's take a look a little bit at this statement. I'm simply demonstrating that we can take the SPDF underscore sales info. And in this case, I want to group it by product key. So the idea is I can get a summary, in this case an average sales amount, by each product key. And so that it comes back to the driver node and I can look at it, I'm converting it to pandas. A Databricks notebook can be a little misleading here because I could simply wrap the SPDF sales group by function and instead of doing the two pandas I could wrap that in a display function and the display function in a notebook will actually take care of all that work for me bring it back to the driver node and display it but I wanted to do something that's more generic so this was something that would also work in Spark. So again here I'm going to just say import dot sql dot functions and then run something similar let's take a look at what I'm doing here so I'm going to be importing the functions now I do want to call out once I've imported any functions in a given Databricks notebook cell I don't have to keep re-importing it however if I don't and I want to be able to jump around the notebook and run individual cells I can get into trouble if I didn't already import the PySpark SQL functions and tried to go directly to the cell it would give me an error because it would say you don't have those functions imported so by importing the libraries in the cells multiple times it does make it easier to jump around your notebook if you're going to run the notebook sequentially then it wouldn't be necessary okay so what we're going to do here is going to take the data frame and we're going to do a group by this time promotion key and then we're going to concatenate the AGG function and we're going to bring in a bunch of different aggregate functions so we're doing what we did before but this time we're going to do it by promotion key because maybe you want to get these statistical values for each promotion that you've done. So let's run that. Now you can see these statistical functions for each promotion. By importing PySpark SQL functions just like that, I'm just going to call the functions in and they're available. For instance, from the, the AVG and the min and the max, it's all directly available. But what would happen if there were other libraries out there that had the same name for functions? We could get into a conflict. So a way that we can avoid that, and something usually done in Python, is to supply a prefix for functions. So instead, here I'm going to say, from PySpark SQL, import functions as f. And what that means is I can prefix any function I want to use with the capital F. So here I'm going to say spdf underscore sales info, and again, agg as we've seen many times already, but it's f.min and f.max. And I'm going to do something a little different here just for a different variation. I'm going to use collect instead of uh, two pandas. And I'm returning the whole thing to lpls underscore sales agg. Let me run that. And it comes back and it gives us our values. So it just made it a little easier. Now I can prefix the f. So if I had a function somewhere that was already called min and it was in some, from some other library, because I prefix it with f, it will automatically go to specifically the ones that are in PySpark SQL. You might be wondering, why does this look so strange? It doesn't look like it did before. It doesn't look like a pandas data frame display. You're right, it doesn't. In fact, I named it LPLS because the L here means it's a list instead of a data frame. Instead of the DF, you're getting LS. And that was to emphasize this is a list. And I can prove that because I'll do a little type LPLS sales AGG and indeed it comes back here and tells us that's a list and it's one of the reasons I'm not as much of a fan of using collect when I'm using a Databricks notebook because it looks a lot nicer if we return 
a pandas data frame. Just to kind of be complete here, I'm doing the exact same thing as I did before, but here I'm returning it to pandas. And that's why I say LPDF, and that stands for local Python data frame. Here I'm doing the same thing. The only difference is instead of the collect method, I'm saying two pandas. And that's going to return a pandas data frame. And since I'm putting it in an object, the object is prefixed with LPDF. It's a local Python data frame. And if I display it, you'll notice it looks a lot prettier. <laughs> All right, our last example is only a variation on what we've already done. What I really want to call your attention to is this piece right here. This allows me to do a count distinct on the combination of two keys. So I'm doing a count distinct on the product key and the customer key. And this could be any columns really you want to get the count distinct of. But instead of just getting the count distinct of say product key, which might be 300 and the customer key could be 1000, I'm actually getting the unique count of both combined, which is should be a larger number. Now to make sure that I can really see that difference, I want to include a filter that says only when the count of the product key is greater than one. That way I'll get to see how the numbers vary are different. Now one thing I want to call attention to is that where clause is actually closer to a having statement than it is where. But you don't in this case use having use where, but if you think about it we're actually referencing the aggregation of product key, right? The count product key. Now that count product key is being generated by this count distinct product key. I'm not renaming the column with an alias statement, so that's what I'm going to get back. And so that's what I have to use in the call function. And notice we imported the call function here. And I really did that. We've already imported this obviously many times, but I wanted to really emphasize that we can't just refer directly to the column. We have to use the call function and then we can use our aggregated column name, which is generated, which can then be compared to what we want. In this case, we want to say, make sure that count is greater than one. So we're filtering out anything that returns a row count of less than one. We're going to convert the whole thing to pandas. We can see what's going on here. And I like the idea of sales territory key. Again, normally we join that to the sales territory table and we'd see like, oh, that's the northeast, that's the south, that's the west, or whatever it is. But if we go to the right, we can now see that we have 157, for instance, products within that sales territory. We have this many customers. But if we look at the combined unique values of product key and customer key, we have a much bigger number, right? Because this is unique com combinations of all these things. So I just wanted to demonstrate a little more complex way that you can use these functions. And I do want to emphasize also, like, why do you care? You may want to stick only with Python code but you need these functions which may not be available in PySpark directly. So in this way you can reach into SQL and get the benefits and stick with purely Python code. So it's just a nicety. Because you're using Spark SQL functions, they perform well, they're designed to be able to be optimized, so it has all those benefits of Spark SQL. To summarize, what we've learned is that we can import Spark SQL functions directly into our Python code and use them and they'll perform well. Hope you've liked this video. Please, as usual, like, share, subscribe, and let other people know about my channel. Until next time, I'm Paul for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.